Everyone in the veterinary industry wants to be leaders in emergency and critical care medicine. At North Star Vets, our ER is the nucleus of our hospital, so we are known and respected for it. Join our private practice that has been independently owned and operated by a veterinary specialist for 22 years. Our 33,000 square foot award-winning main hospital is accompanied by two other hospitals in the Garden State. With 18 specialties, it makes for exceptional collaboration. With over 250 team members, 98 have a tenure of five years or more. So when I pick this topic, it's a little bit basic um, and everyone kind of, you know, this is something that you do in daily basis, but I figure that there's always good to uh, refresh some um, <clears throat> memories. There's nothing groundbreaking here, but I think it's, it's going to be a good relaxing topic for you guys. So first of all, the, uh, before I talk about like puppy murmur specifically, auscultation, like is difficult, I think. Um, and uh, just to share you a story, uh, in my first year of residency, Dr. Abbott, I don't know if anybody had a uh, pleasure of working with him, he's a brilliant cardiologist, uh, and he and I had a, a case, and we listened to this puppy with heart murmur, and uh, he said, uh, it sounds like a dog, but this dog has uh, ventricular septal defect and aortic regurgitation. And, you know, like, you gotta be kidding me, right? You cannot be that, that specific. Um, sure enough, I start doing an echocardiogram and the dog has ventricular septal defect and aortic regurgitation. Uh, and I said, uh, like, how do you perfect the skill of auscultation? And his answer was brilliant. He said, I'll say 30 years because I've been a cardiologist for 29 years and I am continuing to work on my skill and I'm an optimist, so by next year, I'll perfect the skill. So that, uh, so I still have a long way to go, clearly, um, but everyone can uh, work on, you know, auscultation skills because this is kind of thing that's, um, is difficult. So just to share my approach for like auscultation of any um, patient, not just puppies, is that I assume that every dog or cats or anything, turtles, uh, I, like I, I um, assume that they have heart murmur. <clears throat> and my job is to find it and just prove that it's there. Um, so I would just listen to the entire cardiac field and uh, um, uh, also, a good tip is you listen for the silence, which is kind of counterintuitive, because between lup and dub, there should be absolutely nothing. Of course, you can, there, there are gonna be sniffing and your clients will be talking over your earpiece. Yeah, I, I, I've had that before too. <laughs> um, but you're listening for the silence and um, absence of the silence is kind of, you know, what we're looking for here. And, uh, um, so for me, it always takes longer to declare a patient is free of heart murmur, right? Because, you know, I've, I've exhausted all the areas um, that I could um, hear heart murmur. So um, one of the students actually asked me when, uh, when I was a resident, um, you know, I'm going to go out uh, and be a general practitioner. I'm going to see a lot of patients. Do you think I'll have enough time for it? And that's an excellent question because, you know, you... You know, I, I'm, my job is to listen, but then, you know, as a general practitioner, you have really tight schedule and a lot of patients. Um, but, but, you know, I asked her, I challenged her, why don't you listen for a dog for an entire minute and see how long it feels? And it feels like an eternity, right? Like, if you try to listen to a dog's heart for one minute, it takes forever. Um, so you can spare like one minute um, of your time um, for cardiac auscultation um, and that won't impact your schedule significantly. And also you do get better at times. Like I kind of joke with her saying that 
you're not going to do three hours pay for entire, your entire career. You're, you're going to get better and faster. Um, so that's kind of um, my advice to generally to students, of course. So for heart murmur, um, when, you're, when we are characterizing it, characterizing it um, the most important thing, you know, intensity, timing, location, and shape is a little bit um, um, added to it. Um, the intensity, of course, one to six out of six. Um, now, I'm not against being obnoxious about murmur grading. You know, if it's soft, it's soft. If it's, you know, um, can be heard easily, it's, it can be heard easily. I think it should really be like soft, intermediate, or loud murmur, but we have the grading system that we always use. So, um, but, you know, grade five, you feel the thrill. Five or six, I don't know what six is, to be honest with you. You can hear it off the chest, but how, how much? Is it one centimeter off the chest, two centimeters? Like, there's no definition <laughs> for it, honestly. Um, but if you're in the vicinity, and as long as you're consistent, I think it's, it's fine. And then, you know, you might get the report from me. You thought you heard three out of six murmur, and I call it two out of six, or something like that. Um, that just means that we have just two, like, you know, your two, maybe my three, or vice versa, so. The location um, is uh, a little bit um, more challenging. Uh, I put the shape there just to kind of help help out differentiating apical murmur versus basilar murmur. The apex, uh, the, the important um, thing is that you know your differentials are going to be vastly different, um, but. Uh, it is sometimes difficult. Um, you know, sometimes they have both, and sometimes it's very difficult to really um, pinpoint on what, where the location is. In terms of the shape, diamond shape is like uh, shooting a laser gun sound, sound like pew, 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 that kind of um, sound, uh, versus plateau uh, shape murmur is kind of a uh, constant, like shh, 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 which is, you hear that all the time with mitral valve disease four most common um, causes of murmurs in puppies. Um, PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, um, pulmonic stenosis, uh, subaortic stenosis, and of course, innocent murmur. And I think uh, we'll talk about innocent murmur towards the end because which one is innocent and which one is not, and how do, how do I, uh, how am I gonna be able to differentiate that? For congenital heart disease, uh, Dr. Burberry, one of my mentors always said, if you know the breed, you know the disease, um, which is partially true. I've been burned by that before, but uh, which is oftentimes true. Now, these are uh, all um, kind of breed uh, uh, predilection. Of course, nobody's going to memorize that, um, so I kind of change it to kind of what kind of dogs are gen you generally expect to see with each of the congenital heart defect. PDA, uh, you know, the, the you know, poster child for it is German Shepherd. I mean, German Shepherd is poster child for a lot of things. <laughs> but uh, female German Shepherd, because females are more predisposed, um, and uh, that's one of, the, one, of, one of the only uh, heart disease that females are predisposed. Um, but, you know, all kinds of dogs get PDA, like anybody could get PDA, except boxers, apparently. Um, it has never been reported. So if you do hear boxer um, uh, continuous murmur and you suspect PDA, please send it to me. Um, I'll write a case report. Subaortic stenosis usually is a large breed dog problem, like a giant breed dog, like Mastiff. Um, but Golden Retriever, of course, is the, the most prevalent um, um, dogs, a uh, dog breed to get the SAS. Pulmonic stenosis, I think, you know, it, once again, it's, it's if arguably the most common congenital heart defect in dogs. Uh, pit bulls, like bulldogs, uh, get them, but obviously all breed can, can get it. But when I hear it in, in, in pit bulls and um, bulldogs or Frenchies, like I do suspect more, um, more likely that it is uh, pulmonic stenosis. Ventricular septal defect, of course, we don't run into that all the time, um, but she, uh, because Shiba Inu um, and those uh, Akira, those uh, dogs are not that common in the United States. 
So moving on to PDA, which is you know uh, arguably one the most it's uh, pulmonic stenosis and PDA are um, you know uh, most common. Um, it's by basically neck to neck. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of my residency, um, one of the mentor basically told me, you know, you're going to be a cardiologist one day, um, and you will, you know, unfortunately miss some stuff, but no matter what you do, do not miss PDA because you cannot make this up, right? Because some murmurs change as the puppy grow, um, but you know, when, when we see PDA, it's been there the entire time, and I just missed it. So that's a lesson that I learned first week of my residency. When we were inside of our mothers, like fetus, um, we have no use for lung, right? Because the mom gives um, us with oxygen-rich blood. We really don't need to have a... Uh, I mean, we, the, the lungs are basically shriveled up. It's not expanded yet. Um, so <clears throat> in that situation, the pulmonary arteries are uh, completely uh, kind of shut down. And you basically, when you're in fetus, you, you have pulmonary hypertension. We all have pulmonary hypertension at one point uh, before we were born. And because the pulmonary arterial pressure, you know, they are, they are going to be higher than systemic pressure in, in that situation. So the flow of the blood always goes from high pressure to low pressure. So it would be from pulmonary artery uh, to the aorta. So it would be right to left. But um, when you are born, um, take the first breath and you have oxygen and um, prostaglandin. Um, they are all kind of stimulus for um, lowering the uh, pulmonary artery pressure. Um, pulmonary artery is going to dilate. And also that's the signal for um, closure, closure of ductus. So in people, um, you know, if you have, uh, if you're born with, of course, you're going to be born with ductus arteriosus, and um, it's, it should close um, within like seven days. Now, if you still have continuous murmur in, in people, you're going to be given a medication to, to stimulate the closure. But, you know, it doesn't quite work in dogs because they have incomplete um, musculature uh, around the ductus arteriosus. So it, it's trying to close, but it just can't. Um, so they just... Um, they will have PDA for, for dogs. So once uh, the lungs are expanded and pulmonary arteries are opened up and the pulmonary arterial pressure drops, then um, now all of a sudden aorta has much higher pressure than the pulmonary artery, right? The aortic pressure is 120 over 80 um, in normal patients and pulmonary arterial pressure is like 30 over 15. Um, so you are going to have at any given time you will have a, a, a flow from aorta to the pulmonary artery. That's the left to right shunt. Um, so that's um, the reason why we hear continuous murmur because the pressure is always greater in the aorta throughout the cardiac cycle. So you're gonna hear a little bit louder pitch and then a little bit uh, during systole and then a little bit lower during diastole. So it will sound like shh, 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 but there's no silence. Like I. I, I told you that I'm listening for silence. If there's nothing, then that is a PDA. And that is diagnostic for PDA. So if you hear continuous murmur and you're referring, um, you can tell actually to the client that your dog has a PDA. Now, of course, there's like other extremely rare congenital heart defect that does that too, but it's, you know, basically doesn't happen very often. So if, uh, if you're born and the pulmonary artery didn't relax and your pulmonary artery still uh, has a really high pressure, then you will, you are, you're still going to have right to left shunt or bidirectional shunt. In that case, there's not going to be a lot of pressure gradient to uh, drive the flow and turbulence, so you won't hear murmurs. So I have uh, actually recently saw a dog with a reverse PDA. The dog was like four or five, um, and there was no murmur, um, but there was a significant um, evidence of pulmonary hypertension and uh, right to left shunting PDA. Um, but that's going to be extremely rare, and uh, uh, you know, I would never fault anybody for not being able to tell if a puppy has a reverse PDA. Um, 
So in terms of the physical exam, you can, um, you know, continuous murmur is, is going to be a telltale sign. But some of the other things that you are going to see is a bounding femoral pulse, um, which is interesting because the pulse that we're feeling is the difference between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. Now in PDA, um, you, you know, the reason why the aortic pressure doesn't go down to zero, right? So it's, why is it 120 over 80, not 120 over zero? Um, that's because the aortic valve closed and the mus aortic musculature kind of keeps the tension at 80 millimeter of mercury. So now if you have a straw that has a hole in it and you try to drink out of it, it's, it's, it gets kind of annoying, right? So it, the, the PDA is basically like a hole in a straw. So you are going to, you know, the aorta is going to have a hard time keeping that diastolic pressure. Um, so your diastolic pressure falls. Um, and the pulse pressure now therefore becomes greater, so you have a bounding femoral pulses. So the location is important because you know you would never imagine oh, I'm not going to miss a PDA, um, and I also said that. But you know, I first week of my residency there was a, a cocker spaniel that was seven years old. Um, you know, clearly had left apical murmur four out of six, um, thinking mitral valve disease, uh, and uh, you know, my mentor heard something, and I was like, "Hey, can you listen to it again?" I was like, "Yeah, it sounds like a mitral valve uh, disease." And I was like, and then at that point, he changed his tone. I was like, "Listen again," and uh, <laughs> and then I went way cranial, like right under the armpit, and then that's that was a pretty unusual situation, right? Um, Continuous murmur, but rather soft. Um, so, I mean, that dog, I mean, was six, seven years old and has been to vets every year, but no one picked it up. And I can't fault him for it because I missed it too. <laughs> so it is, it does happen. Um, now that dog, um, PDA didn't have to be closed. It was such a small PDA, but the continuous murmur was there. Um, so, you know, it, it, it needs to be um, looked for. Anytime you hear, a dog for the first time, make sure to slide your stethoscope all the way as cranial as possible under the armpit, um, and that's where you're going to hear um, a kind of a focal PDA. And also, like in a large dog, like large puppies, it's also very difficult because it's outside of your normal auscultation window, and you have to go way up for big, big dogs, so it is something to be wary of. Now, um, I always think about, okay, so what if I didn't have the option to do echocardiogram or did, didn't have option, um, uh, you know, I want to give as much information to client as possible without just simply referring, what do I, uh, what can I do in general practice setting? Uh, well, first thing, I guess, would be chest x-ray. So a huge um, heart, you're going to see, uh, that's... Um, the largest heart that, that you will see is for, for a dog with PDA. Um, and you will have a pulmonary overcirculation, so it looks like they all have congestive heart failure, but it's just really, um, you know, a lot of blood is, is going into the pulmonary vasculature, so that they all seem to be more um, wider than, than your normal lungs. Um, so, so, so what do I get out of? This right. So, the, in terms of referral, um, can it wait or can we not? That's also a question, right? So, when you have this X-ray, um, you're gonna say, okay, so this one needs to be seen rather quickly and needs to be closed soon. Um, so, if you do refer and the client have, has the financial means for it, then ACDO, so Amplat um, Canine Doctor. Occluder is the gold standard. Uh, it's a minimally invasive. You you go into the femoral artery, um, you determine the size of the device, and basically deploy it. Um, and I'll show you a video of that. Um, so you your client might ask, so what is the success rate of um, uh, this procedure? Well, it's it's like as successful as neuter procedure. I, you know, of course, this is not. A dog can, um, it, there are risks uh, and, and that kind of thing, but it's really routine procedure for us. Um, so this isn't um, 
uh, something that I get, ex of course I should be worried about it, but uh, it doesn't make me as nervous as other procedures. So once the, it is closed, so now you're gonna you know, spend, for example, at North Star Vets, like six to, six to $8,000, what can I expect? Well, with a successful closure, that puppy can be considered basically a normal dog now. So that's a considerable difference um, between um, that and you know, going into congestive heart failure in a year. Interventional procedure, um, basically that's the device um, that uh, I deployed. Um, and if you do, if you inject the contrast, so we are, I'm in the aorta, I put the, uh, the whole thing into a pulmonary artery and then draw back, basically it has two umbrella type mechanisms, right? So the first, first um, layer will expand and I pull back and then basically deploy the second portion um, in, the, in the ductus. So if you know, some dogs, uh, they're not a good candidate for ACDO, um, you know, ductus may be too big um, and there's not a, a no uh, device that can be placed or this patient generally, uh, speaking, patient can be too small, like, you know, toy breed, dogs with PDA, their femoral artery is not big enough for me to access that. Um, so in that case, surgery can be performed. The surgery is, of course, more invasive and, uh, um, you know, associated with higher rate of complications, but in a, with an experienced surgeon, it can be done as successfully as uh, ACDO. Uh, what if, yeah, the client can afford it, right? I just, you know, usually the story is that I just got this dog. I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> and now, like, or I got this dog for free and now it's becoming like, you know, $6,000, $7,000 dog. Um, and uh, the answer is more than 50, 60% of the dogs will go into congestive heart failure. They will not definitely live as long. Um, and so, there will be cases where you know you just have to, you know, uh, manage it uh, medically because they declined all the procedures. In that case, like it's no different from managing like mitral valve disease dogs. We can start with you know vetmedin or pimobendin, and then if they go into heart failure, then you know sarfurosemide, anazapril, spironolactone, or inalapril. Um, that's kind of all we can do. So when you hear a, a kind of ejection murmur, which sounds like a laser gun that, that I uh, spoke to you about, like pew, 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 and it's up in more closer to the armpit, or sometimes you can hear the same murmur in the thoracic inlet, uh, it's called carotid radiation. So basically you put your stethoscope against the thoracic inlet and then kind of push it in, and then you will hear that um, ejection murmur better. So if you hear, if you're wondering, oh, is this an apical murmur or a basilar murmur, you won't hear apical murmur at the thoracic inlet generally, um, and uh, basilar murmurs tend to do that. So you, that's one easy way to differentiate them. Um, so, so you have three differentials when you have, um, you know, basilar murmur, systolic murmur, uh, pulmonic stenosis, subaortic stenosis, and innocent murmur. So I'm going to start with the pulmonic stenosis. So pulmonic stenosis usually occurs at a valvular level. So the valve um, in their development needs to um, completely differentiate and become three separate leaflets. But in case of pulmonic stenosis, um, it failed to differentiate. So some you know, parts of the valves are fused together. So which causes a narrow opening and kind of a doming of the valve. And the simplest way to explain to the client is, uh, imagine pinching a garden hose. You know, the more you pinch, the faster it's gonna travel, and more pressure is built up behind. So the problem with the pulmonic stenosis dog is um, the fact that in order to generate normal uh, pulmonary arterial pressure, you have to work extra hard, right? So for example, um, 
if the pulmonary arterial pressure should be at 30 millimeter mercury, so if I want to generate 30 millimeter mercury, and then because of the uh, narrowing, you might have to work extra hard, like 130 millimeter mercury. So for this particular example, the pressure difference between the uh, pulmonary artery and the right ventricle is 100 millimeter mercury, which is uh, severe. In cases of this stenosis, like fibular, uh, aortic stenosis, subaortic stenosis, uh, or, or um, pulmonic stenosis, the louder the murmur, the worse it is. Um, so if it's grade two out of six, chances are if it's pulmonic stenosis, that's you know, not gonna be uh, much problem. It's going to be probably mild to moderate, maybe. But if it's five out of six murmur, that's not gonna be mild pulmonic stenosis. Something that you can uh, potentially see um, is jugular venous distension and pulsation. Um, the femoral pulse generally is normal. So something uh, you can do going into radiograph, um, you see really a, a lot of um, sternal contact, see a right-sided um, heart enlargement. The bump that you see uh, on the left side of the screen on the VD view is the pulmonary artery. So pulmonary artery, because it dilates, you see that bump. Um, so that is a classic uh, example of uh, pulmonary stenosis or even um, pulmonary hypertension dog, you might see that. So something that we can um, also do, um, we had a visiting student at North Star Vets um, and uh, there was a dog with a basilar murmur and um, I told him, let's play a little game and let's, let's find out what this dog has without doing uh, uh, an echocardiogram and then just double check our answer with the echocardiogram. And one of the things that I did was an ECG and ignoring all the other things. On D2, you see the QRS complexes are negative, like kind of pointing downwards. Um, that represents uh, that the right heart is big. So that's one way to um, help without more diagnostics. So this would be bad. Um, so dogs, um, you know, just keep that in your memory bank and I'm, I'm gonna explain soon. So the question that you often get when there is um, an owner who cannot afford um, bullion valvuloplasty or uh, is declining more uh, uh, rapidly, it's like how is my dog going to die? Like what should I look for? And majority of the dog with pulmonic stenosis, they don't go into right-sided heart failure. Majority of the dog die suddenly because of the uh, ventricular tachycardia. Because the right heart has had to work so hard for so long, they become thickened and scar tissue forms, and that's a substrate for ventricular arrhythmia, and that's um, kind of syncope is one right uh, symptom. And uh, if syncope, goes on for far too long, well, that's sudden death, so. Now, the, you are gonna be asked like, okay, what is the prognosis for my dog? Um, you know, it just depends on the severity. That's going back to heart murmur intensity, if it's very severe, like you know, grade five or six out of six, well, this, uh, uh, you know, their lifespan will be significantly reduced. Um, so mild is less than 50 millimeter mercury, moderate is 50 to 80, severe is over 80. Generally, uh, recommendations for balloon is for severe cases or dogs with moderate pulmonary stenosis with symptoms. So they have moderate pulmonary stenosis, but they're fainting all the time. Well, that, those dogs may need balloon. So balloon valvuloplasty basically tears open the valve. There's no gentle way to put it. You literally, because the valves are fused, you put the catheter through it and then blow up the balloon and just destroy it. Um, the success rate is 70 to um, 80%, and I think that's pretty accurate uh, because there are cases where the valves are so mineralized that it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't open at all which is not 
really great. I don't like that success rate. I want to say it's like should be like 95%. You know, I was telling uh, a client saying that like, you know, if I told you, you I don't like this procedure because uh, yeah, if I told you that um, I have, a, you know, 70% chance of success for neutering your dog, of course, they are going to think that it's crazy, right? But, you know, it, it can be extremely rewarding procedure. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if anybody asks cost for the uh, valvuloplasty, it's going to be about six to eight uh, eight thousand dollars um, at our facility. So this is our new cat lab. We just um, bought the new uh, C arm to do the procedure. So basically, how it works is we um, inject a contrast in the right ventricle, and then we measure how big is the uh, pulmonary annular diameter is, and then we push the balloon catheter, um, and the heart is not very happy because it's having a lot of ventricular arrhythmia. Just wait until we uh, roll it up because he's going to have a beat tag. Basically, there is a stenosis, and then basically our, our glass becomes a sausage. So for bulldog, special consideration is um, coronary artery anomaly. Um, so the coronary artery, instead of having you know having the right and left coronary artery comes out of a single ostium, wraps around the pulmonary artery, um, and that may be a problem for balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, so that's why I always do uh, coronary angiogram before performing that procedure for those brachycephalic dogs. Because what, if you blow up the pulmonary artery here um, in the, at the bottom image, I'm going to unplug the coronary artery and the dog will be dead like on the spot. Um, I, I think Dr. Borrelli, um, our, uh, my, one of my mentors, it was one of the first person to kind of publish um, this procedure on, uh, in veterinary medicine. And they didn't know why, why bulldogs, like every time they ballooned it, like they just died on the table, but now we know better. <laughs> um, so. so they have a different uh, coronary artery branching? Correct, correct. So they have, uh, they just, um, usually you have right and left, and then nothing wraps around the coronary artery, uh, uh, wraps around the pulmonary artery, like at the top. So the blue, sorry, I don't have a pointer. So the pointer is like rupturing the coronary artery. Correct. Oh, there it is. So the, the, the blue is a pulmonary artery, um, the red is aorta, so aorta, um, the coronary artery comes out of the aorta. Um, so there's nothing really wrapping around here, um, but here you have single right coronary artery and then they, this branch, this one uh, is coming out here. Um, and then it does wrap around the pulmonary trunk. So when you inflate the balloon, that's going to rupture the coronary artery, unfortunately. So we, we uh, I mean, not every bulldog has it, so we are gonna do coronary angiogram and then make sure that we don't have that. If we do, then we have to figure out other options like pulmonary artery stenting or something like that um, to, to have done, but... Um, So they have tried, a very good question, they have tried um, patch graft uh, technique, which is, um, and, and it has been successful. But basically, um, you include cranial and caudal vena cava for um, as short a time as possible. Um, basically, completely occlude any blood going into the right heart, and then you know, basically take out that section of the heart where the pulmonary artery is, and then graft it with the pericardial tissue. So you basically get rid of all the, um, all the, uh, uh, the pulmonary valve entirely. So that is possibility, which I don't think I can do. <laughs> but but something, some people have tried. Um, pulmonary artery stenting is probably the better option. So we put a stent across the pulmonary, uh, pulmonic valve so that it's, it always stays open. Now your question might be, so do, can dogs without, live without pulmonic valve? Uh, the answer uh, is yes. So they can do well with the volume overload. 
they just don't do well with pressure overload. Okay, thank you for the question. For subaortic stenosis, um, it's not aortic stenosis, right? It's a subaortic stenosis, so the, the problem is just below the aortic valve. Um, so, right here, so aortic valve is over here. Um, they develop this fibrous ridge. Um, so, you know, this uh, we won't be able to balloon because uh, it's like a rubber band. So, people have tried ballooning. And when you uh, blow it up, it will expand and then constrict right back. So it, it doesn't work. Um, so this picture right here is uh, an echocardiogram uh, you can, of, of a dog with aortic stenosis. This is aortic valve. That's the ridge that you are seeing represented over here. So heart is upside down, though. So unfortunately, um, golden retrievers are extremely predisposed, and they're like cute puppies, and then, you know, you give a terrible news to the owner, it's not, uh, it's definitely the worst part of the job. Um, it's similar to pulmonic stenosis, right? All the pathophysiology is similar. Um, it's just that the, the femoral pulses will be weak, um, and you, you can sometimes hear the murmur the loudest at the thoracic inlet, so the crowded radiation may be very loud for in case of the subaortic stenosis. So one in interesting note uh, about this is that when, the, you know, you might see a puppy when they are eight weeks old, for example, and then that dog has two out of six murmur, and then now that dog becomes, uh, it grows, and then becomes six months old, and then you hear the murmur, and it's like has a five out of six murmur. So how did that happen? Um, that's because the ridge um, was relatively... Uh, large, so the hole was relatively large compared to the size of the heart. The entire heart grows, but then the ridge remains the same size. So relatively speaking, you have like much worse uh, subaortic stenosis. So the murmur will be louder. So it is possible that uh, if the murmur gets, uh, you know, you might hear a great two out of six murmur, and it's like, yeah, let's see how, how it goes and, you know, um, see if it goes away, let's see if it's a puppy murmur, and if it gets louder and louder each time you listen, maybe we need to suspect this. Um, you know, it, it, has, it has happened multiple times when the client says like, yeah, like my vet just told me that it's a grade two out of six. I was like, well, it probably got louder, right? So, so something that, that might be useful um, to see if it's you know, subaortic stenosis, how worried should I be, is you know, thoracic radiograph, this is very strange, right? Like they, that uh, cranial aspect of the heart is very elongated, uh, and that's because the aorta gets very dilated. Um, so you are gonna see, this is a more of a classic um, subaortic stenosis radiograph. So if you're debating between uh, what kind of, um, should I be worried, or is it innocent murmur versus you know, is it something um, that's serious, like severe subaortic stenosis? Uh, you know, radiograph might be uh, one of them to to differentiate. On ECG, you know, you are gonna it's gonna be a normal, or in a in a really significant cases, you might see ventricular tachycardia. And similar to subaortic stenosis, because the the heart has been uh, generating so much pressure. Um, they may, you know, the most common cause of death is actually sudden death. So we have better data on aortic, uh, subaortic stenosis because um, we actually have uh, survival time uh, more kind of tuned in with the severity of the disease. Mild to moderate, uh, they, you can expect a normal life. We used to say, you know, severe subaortic stenosis are all bad, but turns out that there's another category which is very severe, which is uh, above 130 millimeter mercury of pressure difference. For severe, um, you know, they can live uh, like seven years. Some um, the range is pretty big, so they can live in you know, normal-ish dog life. But for very severe um, subaortic stenosis, they don't live as long. Like three years is a median survival time. So it's really sad uh, disease and. The worst part is that there's nothing you can do about it, right? So we just, it, it 
uh, you know, balloon can be done. Um, if it was a person, what they would do is they op they would open they would do an open heart surgery and scrape out the the uh, the ridge um, that was formed underneath the valve. It is uh, autosomal do dominant. Um, so you know, if your parents, if you have a breeder um, that's coming to your clinic and um, you know has a pretty significant heart murmur and they're trying to breed that dog, you know, they probably should get an echocardiogram beforehand. So. It's the same disease, um, but uh, you know, it, it, the, it, the location of the stenosis can be subvalvular, valvular, or supravalvular, so it can vary, um, but it's, it's essentially in the same disease category. Yeah. So the, the, the tricky thing about this is that, you know, if mom has mild subaortic stenosis and the dad has mild subaortic stenosis, the offspring could have severe, right? It, it's, it, it, it's not like we can breed mild and mild and they expect mild aortic stenosis, um, it's just very, the genetics are rather complicated. So I think, you know, when can we say it is innocent murmur then? Um, so by definition, innocent murmur is murmur without a demonstrable cause. So technically you do need an echocardiogram to say that. Um, just like if you want to call something idiopathic something, you have to uh, at least try to look for the cause. Um, now, in veterinary medicine, for some reason, like innocent murmur became like synonymous, synonymous for puppy murmur. Um, but when I looked at the, the textbooks, and it, it really physiologic murmur is um, there is a physiologic reason for it, like anemia. That kind of, so, so if, if, if you see the report saying that like a seven-year-old dog, um, uh, you know, this murmur is innocent, it's not that I don't know the dog's age. The, the, my preferred uh, terminology for um, murmur without echocardiographic reason for the murmur is innocent. So. But the terminology doesn't really matter. Um, so when do when should you be concerned, right? So if if it's grade low grade murmur, um, you know it's it's okay to wait uh, until they're fully grown, like grade three out of six or less. But if it's grade four out of six, five out of six, six out of six, then that that murmur probably won't reduce over time. The innocent murmur um, are always systolic and they're always basilar and they're never right-sided. Um, so if you just deduce that, basically innocent murmurs are always grade one, two, or three out of six left basilar systolic murmur. So in those cases, we can wait until later, or you can take chest x-ray to see if the heart is significantly larger than normal compared to normal puppies. I think that's also another way to do it. You can run an ECG to see if the ECG leads are upside down, um, but also continuous murmur will like never go away on its own. So that dog has PBA and does need intervention. Right, uh, so right-sided murmur, generally the differential um, is either tricuspid valve dysplasia or ventricular septal defect. Now, ventricular septal defect is gonna be very loud, generally, if it's small. Um, yeah, I, I think in that case, if you're gonna see the dog soon enough, I think it's, it's reasonable to wait, or at least like taking chest x-ray at six months of age to see if, there's, if the heart is significantly large. If it's large, then probably not for the benign cause, but if it's normal size, um, then we can continue to, you at least have a reference image uh, for that puppy. So that's what I would generally recommend if, they, if the client declines echocardiogram. 
that does conclude my talk, but do you have uh, any additional questions? Anything like that? Yes. That, that, uh, so how do I determine if a dog is too small, or, uh, too small for the procedure? Um, that it, it, it does depend, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's a five kilogram dog and has like good like long leg, um, you know, it's, it's, it may be worth to try. Um, if it's a dachshund, maybe I won't be as generous about, you know, because I, all I need to do is access the femoral artery and that's the question. Um, so sometimes, and, and the body weight and uh, uh, femoral artery diameter, I learned that they're not one-to-one -one, um, correlation, so it can be uh, all over the place. But generally speaking, I think for me, um, I usually try to stay above five kilogram. Uh, if it's really small, I'll just refer to surgery so that they can be closed. Cats, uh, you mean for kittens or just cat, cats in general? Uh, cats, cats are, are challenging. <laughs> for sure. uh, they are extremely challenging because they don't, uh, the, the, uh, cats can, can have PDA. Um, but they, the most common congenital heart disease in cat is, is ventricular septal defect, and they're generally very loud, like four or five out of six. Um, now, the innocent murmur in cats, the incidence is way higher, um, and you, know, you may hear four out of six, and you decrease the heart rate, and then it's like two out of six, and it's all over the place with the cats, so it's certainly very, very difficult. And uh, um, you know, I, when I when I clear uh, for anesthesia for cats, you know, I, I really do have a lot of sympathy for you guys <laughs> because it, you know, it, ideally you would echo every cat, but you know that's not um, always feasible. Um, so a lot of it is just trusting. What's uh, X-ray? <laughs> and even X-ray is difficult in cats. So, yes, yes. Uh, cats can have um, all of that, like second degree or third degree V block. Um, we. I've actually considered placing a pacemaker in a cat, um, but their heart rate, um, generally escape rate, is like 120, 130. Um, and some, sometimes cats live a normal, like asymptomatic for 30 degree B block. So you may, like, we may not even see them um, because the client think that the cat is doing fine. Thank you so much.